Um, so it's, it's great to, to really to be here. Actually, I think in that IEEE fellow group, there are only two talks that I, I, I got invited to, and this was by far the most uh, welcoming, thanks to Professor Chen. So I'm going to hear, be talking about artificial intelligence and in its real applications. So I just wrote this book called AI Superpowers. And the reason I wrote the book is that we are a, the leading venture capitalist in China investing in artificial intelligence. We began about five years ago, just about when we saw the impact of deep learning. We realized this was going to make a big difference. Uh, as in VC, we were very secretive about it. We invest in a lot of companies. Didn't tell anybody. But uh, two and a half years ago, uh, the Sputnik moment came. That is, uh, AlphaGo beat Li Zedong. And that shocked the whole world and made artificial intelligence the hardest thing. <clears throat> so we thought, okay, we might as well tell the world. We've been doing this for a while, and our portfolio companies are doing great. Um, however, as we moved forward and made more and more investments, as more capital came to China and U.S., invested in more AI companies, and they gained more uh, acceptance and made more progress, I realized that many of the companies that are in AI and many of the ones we invest in are taking away people's jobs. And while many AI can create value, make money, uh, some of them unavoidably are displacing people and doing so at a pace that will be pretty fast. So I felt it was the responsible thing to do to write a book and explain that the future of work will change. So I talked to a bunch of publishers. They said, we'd love to publish your book, but you're Kai Fu Li. Your book cannot be published without the word China in it. So so they said, this is what we're going to have to do to make sure the book uh, is, 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 is read because your China angle is unique. So actually, if you get my book, it's a buy one, get one free. Uh, <laughs> it's intended to be AI and the future of humanity, and you get a free book on China entrepreneurism. <laughs> <laughs> and the two actually fit together. I work very hard on this. But anyway, before I start, let me tell you something about AI. So most of you probably know AI, deep learning, but I want to bring a real expert to tell you something about this. Here he is. It's a great thing to build a better world with artificial intelligence. Wait. And you thought, <laughs> I think President Trump will be very pleased to know that not at a rally he gets this kind of applause. <laughs> and uh, what this shows is that not only does his granddaughter speak uh, Chinese, he seemed to speak Chinese, but actually no. It was a speech synthesis built by a Chinese company using deep learning. So articulating the two concepts, I'd like you to walk away with. One is that deep learning is amazing. Um, and secondly, that China is pretty far ahead in being able to build something this powerful. So what is uh, AI? AI, I think um, a lot of people in think about science fiction, about human capabilities. Uh, some of people have read books um, entitled Super Intelligence, Singularity is Near. So they are thinking of the right sides, artificial general intelligence, or the ability to match or even beat human capabilities of thinking. And then what I'm going to talk about is actually weak AI um, or narrow artificial intelligence that is using um, pattern, is effectively pattern recognition techniques that are very powerful by using huge amount of training data in one domain, it does a superhuman capability, but has no ability to think or understand the way we think about the words thinking and understanding. It has no common sense, it has no cross-domain knowledge, it has no creativity, no idea of concepts, and certainly no self-awareness or emotions. So, what I'm going to talk about is the left side, because I don't see any path to the strong AI. So despite what we see in, our, in the science fiction, I think we're very long ways, if ever, going to reach strong AI. That's my personal opinion. 
there are people who disagree, but um, what's also important is that even though the name weak AI sounds weak, but actually it's extremely powerful. The, te the, the technology you just saw in speech synthesis can be used in so many applications that if you can gather a huge amount of data and train a deep learning network, uh, it can make decisions, classification, synthesis, um, predictions at superhuman accuracy in many, many domains. And that will create huge value and actually displace a lot of jobs. So the AI I'm talking about, when I use the word AI, I mean AI as a tool, not as this uh, future fantasy that we see in science fiction. Um, that one set of technology, deep learning and affiliated technologies, has four waves of possible um, implementation, uh, implementations. We're actually in the wave, it, it, we're in the midst of taking the deep learning technology and applying it to many different things. So I'll quickly tell you the four waves and then I'll go into each one. Uh, Internet AI is taking AI, deep learning, applying it to the internet, uh, to apps, to mobile apps. The business AI is taking AI and applying it to business, to banks, insurance companies, governments, universities, hospitals, and so on. Um, perception AI is giving AI the ability to see and hear with computer vision, speech recognition, perception. It is digitizing the physical world um, with data that would otherwise be transient and lost but it's capturing them, preserving them, and using them to create applications that weren't before possible. And then in the fourth wave is autonomous AI, and that's when AI gains the ability to move. Um, if perception AI is giving AI the eyes and ears, then autonomous AI is giving AI the ability to have arms and legs. Maybe not physically shaped like arms and legs, but they can move and manipulate. And in these four waves, a lot of the science fiction uh, capabilities come true, but they don't result in something that is human-like. So let me now go into each wave of the AI. So the first wave is the Internet AI, and that's the domain where there is the largest amount of data. Because AI only works with massive amounts of data, uh, so what other domain do we have more data? Internet is the space where we have the greatest amount of data that can be used for search engine, online advertising, social network. So every time you are clicking uh, in a new, uh, Facebook newsfeed, you're teaching Facebook something about someone like you who would like to see more of this. Every time you're buying something on Amazon, a similar message. Every time you pay through PayPal, uh, or Venmo, and every time you use um, a search and click on an ad, you're giving uh, very strong signals that someone like you would like to see more of this. Okay, so that's why these systems have got better and better. That's why we feel Google search today was more accurate than it was 10 years ago, because all the data creating the virtuous cycle, right? Uh, so. AI in the internet not only requires massive amounts of data, it requires labeling. So labeling will tell it, I liked it, I bought it, I clicked Facebook like, or I did something. So I see a lot of Chinese faces here. Maybe many of you use Meitu. <laughs> Meitu uh, those of you who are not Chinese, maybe you use Beauty Plus. Yes, no, maybe not. So Meitu or Beauty Plus is a selfie enhancer. You take a selfie, and then it makes you beautiful, okay? But it is a, another example of the internet application uh, that uh, actually I think we'll have it as an example. It's an, it's an application that is kind of taken over China by storm. It, it has um, uh, processed six, seven billion photos. Um, it has 1.2 billion users worldwide, uh, all the selfies, and uh, you think it's all for ladies, uh, but actually no, there's a fair percentage of men users as well. So you know who you are. <laughs> so how do you label data from A2? Well first, for those of you who use it, did you notice this year compared to five years ago, the automatic beautification works a lot better. That you would just take a photo with it and you're done. 
you wouldn't go in and tweak little things, right? So how did that happen? It happened because of AI. The AI in May 2 is using each selfie as training data. Think about what you do after you take a selfie. You might um, post it on uh, Instagram or Chinese social media, or you might um, uh, save it on your, in your iPhone photos, or you might delete it, right? Or you might go in and tweak it some more. In each of the cases, you're giving very valuable feedback, right? Every time you tweeted it or saved it, you're telling me to, you did a good job, make me more like that. And every time you delete it, it says, oh, yuck, don't make me like that. And every time you tweaked it, well, it saved it, okay, what you tweaked, whether you enlarged your eyes or widened your skin or whatever, um, do more of that for me. And then it learns to be personalized for every type of people, a different type of beautification is needed. And that's in fact why it's rebranded as Beauty Plus in the US, because Americans don't want to be beautified as much as Asians. Um, that's a culture, cultural thing. Uh, Americans prefer naturalness, but Asians, including Japanese and Koreans, want a lot of beautification. But Indians, they have something different. Anyway, we're not going to... <laughs> African, also very different. So anyway, we're not going to... Someday I can tell you much more about the what beauty means in each country. But what this is, is that it's a personalized, targeted, um, user feedback, learned improvement. So actually, there are a lot of... Um, um, uh, a lot of the internet giants became giants because they use AI. Why does Amazon, Facebook, Google make so much money? Why does Tencent, Alibaba make so much money? It's because they have an engine that you can set an objective function. Facebook can say, I want the most minutes per user and, and do whatever it takes to make the user stay longer then you're going to be presented with things in the newsfeed that will maximize the minutes you stay in Facebook. Amazon can optimize the number of minutes, the amount of revenue, or the amount of profit that it has. So the ads that it shows you can be used to prolong your stay on Amazon.com or maximize the amount you buy or maximize the net profit of all the purchases. So that is the power of AI, is that it has this magical knob you can tweak to achieve whatever business goals are necessary. Um, and, and probably some of you from China are hearing a lot of new Chinese apps and are wondering, um, so are these AI apps, right? There's the Toutiao, Kuaishou, TikTok, <laughs> Pinduoduo. Those are all companies that I, th I think, sorry for this, are not, not Chinese. These are, the companies I just named are, are worth a total of $120 billion. And you've never heard of them. And these are Chinese companies that are building new internet AI applications. Well, is Pinduoduo really AI application? Well, I'll, I'll prove it because uh, the CEO of Kuaishou, uh, Toutiao, and Pinduoduo were all my former employees in Google or Microsoft in the AI departments. So if you're studying AI, this is going to be, a, this shows you, you're going to have, possess some great skills if you can go into the right area and create a phenomenal amount of value. These three companies I named are some of the new verticals for startups that actually manage to build up user base and apply AI in very short period of time. Pinduoduo is three years old, Douyin is three years old, so maybe f four years old, a total maybe seven years old. So I just named four Chinese companies that are all built recently, but because they use AI to target each individual user to get them to really like the product and spend money, they grew up very, very rapidly. So that's the first wave. I've already told you about the May 2 as an example. Let's go to the second wave. Well, the second wave would be um, businesses that have large amounts of data. So in a bank, um, previously, I've visited many banks. Usually there's this poor person sitting in the meeting with the Chinese bank. There's a poor person at the end of the table who look, looks up beaten up a lot. That usually is the head of the data center. Uh, because the bank, you know, the, the sales person, the product person, the customer person, these are all generating revenue. The data center person, that person only spends money. 
it's a cost center that bleeds money and doesn't bring back anything for the company. But guess what? This has just changed because that data that's been stored by the bank that used to be required for archival or government or legal or compliance reasons now suddenly is very, very valuable because you can use that data, um, all of customer transactions, feed it into the AI and use it in all kinds of tr um, banking operations such as targeting each customer with products the customer might buy, um, asset, asset allocation, credit card fraud detection, and uh, loan approvals and things like that. So it's actually incredibly powerful. And um, there are a lot of areas such as insurance, securities, investments. Uh, I was at Citadel yesterday and uh, they obviously can't tell me anything they do, but uh, I, I asked how many people are working on machine learning, everybody raised their hands. So this, these virtual things, finance is an area that was never designed for humans to do because it's large amounts of data in and you make decisions and money comes out like a, like a cash printing machine, right? There's no logistics factory operations delivery or manufacturing involved. It's just numbers game. It's the stock market, banking, insurance, all fabricated virtual quantitative games that we humans made up, but we're not good at it. AI is gonna take, that, take over uh, over time. I'll give you another example that's um, in this category that we funded. It's in my book called a company called Smart Finance. What it does is it's an app that you can download and it will instantly give you a loan for maybe $200 to $1,000 instantly. Um, and just download it. All you have to do is fill in your name, your address, your um, uh, take a selfie, and then type in your uh, equivalent of social security number. It's a Chinese company, so you actually can't find it on the app store. Uh, but um, I won't tell you the name. I'm not trying to advertise for it uh, because the interest rate is pretty high. But here's how it works. You basically upload that five, six pieces of information and give it permission to upload some data from your phone. For example, um, the same level of information you give to Facebook. So your contact list, apps list, the type of phone you have, and so on. And what actually this system does is it feeds everything into a deep learning system and then decides whether to give you the loan or not. And it gives the loan to about a third of the people who apply, rejects two-thirds for the reasons, risks-related reasons, and then the one-third that get the loan, they pay a 36% interest annually and uh, the default rate, what would you think the default rate might be? So suppose you go to Chicago, the downtown Chicago, and let's say you carry $200,000 and you're in 200, two $200 bills and strangers come up and they just give you some information and you give them the $200. So you give $1,200 loans. How many of you would be willing to risk $200,000 that way? How much of it do you think you'll ever get back? <laughs> what do you think the default rate will be? Well, the default rate for smart finance was 3%. So think about this. You have a default rate of 3% and then an interest rate of 36%. You do the math. It's a very, very profitable business. Well, how did they do it? It turns out the, all the data on your phone is incredibly valuable. Each little piece, not that valuable, but in aggregate, amazingly valuable. So it has a total 3,000 features from your phone. So it has some pretty obvious things like um, you know, your contact list, uh, the name, your, your parents' number, is that a real number or not? There are ways that can be automated and found out. Um, and do you have any bad guys on your list, on your contact list? Um, and, um, and they have a blacklist of people who've cheated them before, so they would cross-reference. And of course, things like what apps do you have installed? Would you have any gambling apps, illegal apps? Would you have any gaming apps? Um, you know, how much time you play, spend gaming every day. What's the model of your phone? Is it a $2,000 phone or is it a $50 phone? And that is correlated with your likelihood of payback as well. And it would have the day of the month. Why does that matter? Because if you're borrowing money three days before a payday, re very reasonable. Three days after a payday, not so reasonable because you just got paid. Well, how does it know your payday? Well, again, it's through deep learning, right? You know the person's name, address, and uh, um, 
and the address could be the company name, it could be a dormitory of a factory, so it can infer where you work and what, on what days you're paid and whether you're paid weekly or monthly, and therefore the day of borrowing is it before or after a payday. So all those things can be inferred by the deep neural network, and what we're, what we're doing is second guessing what the deep learning is thinking. We actually don't know what's going on, but these are the things that matter, the day of the week, the day of the month, and the most amazing thing that matters is the battery level. The battery level actually made it into the feature list. So you would think, battery level, how does that relate to my defaulting on the loan? It's slightly correlated if you think about it. If you're someone who chronically runs out of battery, you're probably a tiny bit less responsible <laughs> and maybe a little more likely to default on the loan. So the power of this deep learning is that it has 3,000 parameters each contributing a tiny bit. Think of the battery level as contributing maybe one millionth of the whole thing. But every millionth matters. And, and they're, when they're all multiplied together and decorrelated, that power of predicting your returning the loan or not is dramatically better than any human can do. Um, I mean, I would challenge any human loan officer within, don't give them one second, give them one day. I would challenge a loan officer to come up with this lower default rate. So hopefully this in-depth example gives you an idea of how businesses can use data and can get disrupted. And data can be old data, but data can also be new data. And some of it will be traditional businesses updating their business process. Some of it will be disruption coming out of the entirely new entrepreneurial uh, companies. So we're still in fairly early stages of adopting AI for business. Um, in US, is actually quite a bit ahead because of the advanced work that's done with data warehousing, with data that's in structured storage, but that still varies industry to industry. Banking data is very regularly stored. Hospital data is still quite messy. But US data is better than Chinese data. So here is some advantage to US in terms of the quality of the data. Uh, so I think the, uh, there has been and will be a wave of B2B AI startups. In fact, most AI startups that we see nowadays are B2B. That means you build a software that you sell to a company and the company uses its data they don't give you your, their data, they run it on their data and make sure it works. So you might be a banking AI company selling AI to a bank with the functions I described. So I'm going to give you an example called the uh, uh, Fourth Paradigm. Fourth Paradigm is a, is a company that is um, selling basically AI services to banks, insurance, and um, a lot of other industries. They have an AI platform. Um, they think of each company um, in the way that they think a bank should have a customer profile with all the applications revolving around it, with AI providing value in all those applications. And this is a company that is now uh, it's the standard AI technology used in three of the four major banks in China, and they're improving rapidly. They're helping uh, banks uh, save a lot of money. When they first went in to sell the bank software to banks, banks were very hesitant because they have their old ways. They have RFPs and processes. But two things happened that really changed them. One is that Fourth Paradigm figured out some risk-free ways for them to try AI, right? If a bank put AI in asset allocation, immediately you're putting your customers at risk. If you put it immediately in credit card fraud or loan, that's very risky. So they found an application, it's called um, new customer prospecting. So do you ever receive um, spam phone calls from banks? Uh, when you go back to China, maybe a text message or a phone call that says, I am from this bank and uh, we have this new product uh, that you might want to consider. It returns 7% interest if this, this, or that. You ever get those calls? Yeah, so they said, why don't we do an AI software for you, for you to figure out what, pro what financial product to spam, I mean to call uh, each customer in a way that the customer is most likely to buy the product. You've got nothing to lose. You're making 500,000 spam calls a day anyway, and you're selling you know, 300 products a day. Now you just put in our software that tells your agent, it's still human agents, Keep all the processes the same, 
but we give you a different list of customer. We give for the same list of customers, we tell you what to sell to each one. And for some of them, don't bother them because they never buy anything. So we found that it improved the conversion rate by 65%, which means if you made 100,000 calls and sold uh, 100, now you sold 165. So for a bank, that's a dramatic improvement in performance. And this is a very good trick for a startup to do, is that you go plug in the business process in a way that doesn't hurt the business. That is kind of a, doesn't change anything, but you just plug right in. If it works, then they get better numbers. If it doesn't work, there's no harm done. It's easy to do an experiment. So that's how they got in the door. So they're very clever. Most AI startups need to find a clever entry like that. The other big thing is when um, China announced the national AI plan in 2017, July, a lot of banks said, okay, we're, we better buy some AI. So that was uh, quite helpful. That was the other thing. So Fourth Paradigm is now an official unicorn, a billion dollar company with very rapidly rising uh, revenues and generally viewed as the, uh, the very top company um, in, in, the financial, in the financial space. Um, so the third wave is digitizing the real world. Online and offline are merging. I mentioned through cameras, sensors, microphones, it's capturing things in the, in the real world. And that can be used in you know, security applications when we come in through immigration to any country. Many countries have installed the ability to um, recognize your face and see if you are who you say you are and let you in. And some of these technologies have advanced actually further in China. The company we invested in uh, called Face++ Plus Plus, has installed the, the face recognition uh, as a seamless interface. Basically, you put the cameras, let's say, at the airport, and then um, it will watch you as you walk around and recognize who you are. If you're on the terrorist list, most wanted list, uh, someone will apprehend you and ask you a bunch of questions. Um, so if you look like someone who's a bad person, maybe uh, put on different makeup so you don't get approached. Um, also, it works in corporates. So in my company, Sanovation Ventures, we don't have a badge. Our faces open all the doors that they're supposed to open. So that part of science fiction is, hits us sooner, um, faster. Also, we see that this, um, this can help re-engineer a lot of uh, existing applications. With computer vision, uh, you could build Amazon Go, autonomous store. You can build um, s uh, smart transportation. A lot of autonomous vehicles are based on computer vision. You can build smart warehouses. Uh, you know, Amazon currently has Kiva, which is when you buy a box of five, th when you buy five things, um, the way Amazon sends the box to you is each of the five things they would automatically have little robots that use computer vision and, and move to the human, and then the human would pick out the item and put it in the box, and then the box is closed and sent to you. A lot of that is based on computer vision. Uh, in the future, that human will also be done by robotics. So that's an example. It can happen in education, it can happen in healthcare, so there are a lot of places. Um, in education, for example, um, you can use it to do roll call so the teacher doesn't have to count who's in the room and who's missing, who went to bathroom. Uh, people can just go, kids can go more in and out because they're tracked, if they're willing to be tracked, if their parents are willing to have them to be tracked. And also uh, automatic grading of the homework. So it's, it's OCR, but there's also computer vision technologies that can be plugged in to grade all the homeworks, including the mathematical proofs and the chemistry formulas and so on. So all that is already happening in China. These are all in our portfolio companies. And some of the education apps might include a remote teacher teaching. It's an Uber-like system called VIP Kid that connects an American teacher with a Chinese kid. And this company is actually now um, hiring about 40,000 American uh, elementary school and middle school teachers to teach on part-time basis, on the Uber basis, uh, about 600,000 Chinese kids, all paying about um, $50 an hour, so very good pay. And AI can be used to, uh, to see um, whether the kids are happy with the, the teacher, whether they're responding, whether they're falling asleep, and those can be signals that are useful for 
for the system to rate teachers and also give feedback to the teachers and the parents. So there are a lot of uses of these types of uh, computer vision technologies. Um, of course, there's also speech-driven uh, technologies, such as um, uh, Amazon Echo. Um, that I, I worked on speech recognition in the 80s, so I'm very excited to see, really, Echo, uh, Alexa, as the first speech product that succeeded. But one of the magic about the success was not how well the speech worked, but that they uh, went after the problem using speech as a speech-first interface. A lot of people worked on speech for PCs, speech for um, phones. And the problem is PCs were made to be a keyboard and mouse product. Speech is a fifth wheel. Phones are multi-touch based. Speech is a fifth wheel. And only when you have a product such as the Alexa that has no screen and no other interface, speech is the only way it forces you to deliver and build a great product around it. So that, I think, is the magic. So the next speech application will be some environment like that where it uh, can be a speech-first, AI-first implementation, and that's important. And that also means user interface design will be important if you want user interactivity to be a part of that. So um, an example in this case I'll use is a Face++ or MegaV is a company we fund, a computer vision company. Um, the top four computer vision companies in China are valued totally at $10 billion, significantly higher than American equivalent companies. And this te is a technology that started with face recognition and it's deployed in a lot of places. And at airports, it can recognize up to 3 million faces. Uh, I don't know if any of you can recognize 3,000 faces, right? So it's much better than human capability. If you think about how powerful deep learning is, use this as an example, right? We as humans, we were born with one of our top priorities as recognizing faces, wasn't it? That as a baby, recognizing our parents' faces was so critical to our survival, so it was one of the most innate skills that we learned as we were first born. And that skill now is blown away by AI. That face recognition accuracy is much higher with AI, but also it can recognize 300, uh, um, 3 million faces at the same time, large enough for the entire world's criminal database uh, to protect us as we you know, board planes so that uh, tragedies like 911 would have a much lower likelihood of happening. But that's just one application. This company is working on other applications such as uh, robotics, warehouse. You know, in the China, in the, if you look behind the scenes in e-commerce, there are still many humans doing routine work. And that routine work can be much better done by machines if you could combine computer vision into the process. For example, I described the Amazon warehouse where it's still the human that goes in and picks each item and puts it in your box that was sent to you. There's no reason why uh, that couldn't be bought, done by a machine. But that machine would require a robotic arm, ability to grasp, as well as computer vision uh, guiding the robotic arm to take each item and put it in the box. So we think that is going to be a big application that will be coming up next. So in the third wave, I think this will really revolutionize many, many areas, but I think we can begin by saying, I think the next big one is in the warehouses, where uh, grasping and putting things in is a routine task that AI can do very well. Another very big one will be machine translation. Um, <clears throat> it's, or, it's kind of reaching the cusp of human-level translation for casual needs. Uh, I, you go to a lot of conferences, uh, speeches like this would be simultaneously recognized and translated in multiple languages, and that's going to get dramatically better with more data. And, but that's really just the beginning. Beyond that, we will see autonomous stores. Uh, in the case of um, Amazon Go, it's a very fancy store that tracks um, the person, um, but also looks at what you picked up and bought and automatically um, checks you out. So you could go to the shelf and look at an item and pick it up and look at it and put it back. To the system, that's just like you going to the Amazon web page, clicking on that page and didn't buy, right? Or if you did buy it, it's just, just like in the, in, in the 
web page that you did buy. So essentially, you're making the offline world uh, with the intelligence of online so that the store owner knows what you looked at. In fact, it can know a little more because if you picked up the item, looked at it, and looked in disgust or, or uh, oh my god, you still have chalks, Northwestern. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen one of these for you know, 10 years. Wow. OK. I'm very impressed. OK. <laughs> so, you, so you pick this item up, and you frown, or you look disgusted. You throw it back. Now you know something that online you couldn't know, because online you didn't detect emotion. So you can have a retail store with, um, with knowledge of what each user is thinking, intentions, doing, emotions, and use that to better target advertising or improve user experience. Um, you could also check, check out for the person. You can um, uh, have a basket or a tray, put things on it, and have it automatically charged to the person. Um, and, and also, you can have an autonomous, uh, so a fully autonomous store could be a store in which you just go in and put all the things in the bag and they just walk out. It doesn't even check you out because it knows what you took. The computer vision saw that you took the chalk and put it in your bag and basically put it on your mobile payment. So that's another possibility uh, with, uh, with computer vision. Uh, and, and when you apply that to fast food, that's another set of possible uses. Uh, we're funding a company called F5 Future Stores. And what that is, is auto think of it as autonomous McDonald's, except they make Chinese food. Uh, so, you know, beef noodles and fishball soup and salads and cucumber salad, things like that. But you go in and scan your face, everything's made behind the scenes in a giant machine, and the robot arm gives it to you, and the price is less than half of McDonald's. So those kinds of robotic services um, plus computer vision, I think, will change a lot of the businesses that we have today. Finally, the fourth wave on the age of full automation, uh, of course, that includes the F5 Future Store example I gave you, but it also includes uh, assembly lines where increasingly more things are being done by the robot. And that actually is harder than most people think because it's not just a matter of software, AI, deep learning. You actually have to make the mechanics and the robotics work, which is a little more difficult. So on the factory floor, it will probably begin <clears throat> with inspection, watching for um, blemishes on your iPhone to reject, or looking at the IC board to see if every chip is soldered properly. That's kind of the low-hanging fruit. Then, I think mass producing something that is large in quantities and the factory is very big and expensive, but the item doesn't change too much year to year because otherwise you have to do the machine learning over again. So building such things, so phone, iPhone actually is not a very good example because it's updated every year. So, and there are so many different models, but things that are relatively constant in shape, the assembly of that can be done automatically. Um, also, commercial uses. One of uh, my favorite applications uh, that we invested in is a company called Dishcraft. It's actually an American company. Uh, they build um, robotic dishwashing ro um, systems. So, unlike your dishwasher, you basically pick up your tablecloth, dump everything in, close, and and then it washes everything, puts the plates in one pile, bowls in one pile, chopsticks in one pile, uh, forks in one pile, and all the refuse put into recycling bins. That sound like a good product? You want one? <laughs> so when I sign the books, uh, just take, write me a check for $300,000 uh, for each that you would like to buy. That's the price today. Does that sound outrageous? But actually not, because if you're a big restaurant, and you employ uh, six dishwashers, that is the cost of a, uh, of a, a dishwashing robot. Uh, buying such a robot, you are essentially paying the same cost as hiring six dishwashers. And in one year, you get your money back. And then over time, this product will be cost reduced to you know, much more affordable levels. So um, it will go into, also we've invested in a number of agricultural robots for, um, pesticide and uh, uh, fertilization, and also for picking fruits 
that requires computer vision and also very good grasping for strawberries, right? How do you take, pick one off without damaging it? But those are all things that um, I think people, um, you know, it's hard to hire people to do that, especially in America. The pay is not that good and it actually, you have, you're bending down all the time uh, picking strawberries. So there, there are fewer and fewer people who want to do that, so those become possible robotic tasks. And of course, the biggest application in the fourth wave is um, autonomous vehicles. Um, autonomous vehicles is not just a button on your Tesla that you push to say, drive for me for a while. Autonomous vehicle is going to disrupt the entire society because it will mean uh, in combination with electrical vehicles and uh, sharing economy, in the future we will no longer buy cars. Cars are the worst investment we'll make in our lifetime. Well, maybe except for yesterday, stock market. <laughs> worst, <laughs> one could do worse yesterday, but uh, generally speaking, a car depreciates 96% of the time when it's not being driven. It has only value 4% of the time when you're driving it, but if you had an Uber, that's half the cost, arrives in 30 seconds, and never has a discourteous driver, uh, because there is no driver, uh, would you not want to use that and never want to buy a car again, right? So it, is, uh, it can be more efficient. Uh, it's fast, if Uber arrives faster than our parking, then it's, it's providing efficiency, cost savings, it's better for emissions and pollution. It's better for the environment. Uh, it's better for traffic congestion. And we no longer need parking lots. We just need uh, basically groups of these Uber vehicles that go wherever people are, right? When they found out that Kai Fu's giving a lecture and there are 500 people here, there are a bunch of Ubers hovering there uh, at the end of my lecture ready to come in and take you. So they're to get you in 30 seconds. All this can be done in the future. So providing incredible convenience and of course providing most importantly safety. You know, as AI gets better with more data, uh, the first day autonomous vehicle launches, it might be only slightly better than people, but in five years, 10 years, it'll be a lot better than people. Uh, it'll be a lot safer, much less, uh, much, much less casualty and fatality. And uh, eventually cars will start talking to each other. You know, one car can warn the others if it has a flat tire. You know, I have a flat tire, stay away from me. People, drivers can't do that. Um, a car can tell another car, you know, my boss is rushing to work, get out of the way, I'll give you 20 cents, right? That's possible. You could have two cars negotiating to say, okay, we're gonna just uh, miss each other by one centimeter. It's a very narrow road, but we'll miss each other by one centimeter. And people can't do that. Eventually, um, the only harm on the road will be us. I mean, we as drivers are the only ones who will cause serious damage to our lives. And then at that point, driving will be outlawed, right? At least on, at least on you know, highways and certain roads, increasingly outlawed. Just like today, you can't ride a horse on an interstate highway. Uh, but don't worry, if you love to drive, uh, there will always be a place you can drive. Just like there are farms, you can still ride a horse. Uh, <laughs> There will be farms where you can still drive a car one day, but autonomy will take over. People debate whether it's five years or 25 years. It's a pretty long range. We don't know. They are optimists, they're pessimists, but one thing for sure is if you look at the entire industry, the, all the capital is rushing to autonomous vehicles. All the smartest computer vision people are going into autonomous vehicles. Um, all the automotive companies have given up and said in the future it'll be autonomous. All the sharing economy companies, all the electrical vehicle companies are saying this is the future. So when the entire industry is totally aligned, accepting that this is gonna come, and smart, mon smart money, smart people are aligned, this will happen. So I would tend to be closer to the optimistic side, even though I know there are serious technical issues to be overcome. And once I think autonomous vehicle arrives uh, at a truly autonomous level, I think that becomes the possibility of a next operating system. Just like we had an operating system for PC, Windows, and then we had Android for phone, the next big one I think will be one 
based on autonomous vehicle. And that one should be applicable to many robotics applications because they all have the same movement, feedback, computer vision, sensors, uh, integration required. Once you get that done for a car and then cost reduces through volume, there are many, many applications. Um, but I don't think someone should go build the operating system now. Operating system always comes out of actually real deployment and then extracting it later. So we're, I'm very, very optimistic about the power of the fourth wave, even though it will take some time uh, before that happens. Uh, one of the companies we fund is also a unicorn called Momenta in China. Uh, it's a very young group of about 300 engineers, all brilliant young PhDs who work incredibly hard. Uh, they're, they're one of the few companies that has an L3 and L4 at the same time. Uh, their belief is gather a huge amount of data and use computer vision only. Get that to be as good as you can because that's, that's the way you can build the cost effectively. But then you have a basis uh, for adding expensive sensors like the LiDAR and make that also very, very good. Uh, so it's a very unique proposition. Most companies doing L3 kind of have a dead end, but they're actually doing L3 and L4 at the same time and making excellent progress. So again, for those of you not familiar, L3 is where um, the car can only do limited things, like drive for me on the highway, follow the car in front of me, uh, and then the person takes over when you're back in the city, um, or, or, or uh, uh, change lane for me. That's L3. L4 is basically the car is driving, like what we saw in Waymo doing, starting to do in, uh, in Phoenix. So <clears throat> these are the examples of AI and most of my talk. Next, I want to talk about um, when does AI not work? Well, it only works when there's massive data labeled in one domain with huge amount of compute power, assuming it's a hard AI problem, and also some experts. And let's talk about the um, US and China as the last part of my talk. So if you look at the current state of U.S. and China. Uh, U.S. is way ahead in research. If you look at the top, um, you know, um, 14 researchers, they're all Americans and Canadians. If you look at the top 100 researchers, they're probably 70% American and maybe 2% Chinese. If you look at the top 1,000 researchers, they're probably 65% American and 6% Chinese. So the gap is quite large at the very top level. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, the Chinese are rapidly uh, growing at the bottom of the pyramid. And if you look at the top million people who are involved in AI in some way, probably 60% Chinese. So this is the, this is the, <laughs> right? Many of you seated here who've decided that the only thing worth studying is AI and deep learning. This is actually may not be a good thing, but this, this is the natural Chinese phenomenon that the students chase the most exciting area, and this is the area they're choosing to chase. But nevertheless, the top research is owned by U.S. So if you're merely reading headlines in the newspapers, you'd think U.S. is way ahead, right? New AI uses in medicine, healthcare, retail, games, and so on. Also, U.S. has been the leader in technology in every imaginable way, uh, pretty much world dominating from the days of the PC to the days of smartphone, all American leading the whole world. It's the whole world really revolved around Silicon Valley, uh, especially if you live in Silicon Valley, you absolutely feel that way. Uh, but that is not the case anymore because something happened about 15 years ago that China emerged as a giant market starting from the top going clockwise and then lots of money and VC go, went to China funding a lot of really smart entrepreneurs who built a lot of great companies that had a lot of great products that got more people to grow the market. And the government is a very techno-utilitarian in letting technologies have a shot before regulating it. So that 15 years where the loop ran again and again and again, and the Chinese internet population uh, went from 100 million to 800 million. The Chinese total market capitalization of internet and mobile companies went from 120th of US value to one to one with US. And this was all pre-AI. So that has led to essentially a, 
a um, split of the single universe revolving around Silicon Valley now into two universes. Imagine half of the market valuation is in China. So how can China not have its own universe? But the typical American media portrays China as copycat with protectionism. That's how China got to the one-to-one. -one. Um, I'm not denying there was a lot of copycat and some protectionism. But what's really important to realize is that China has developed its own business model. And the business model evolved out of incredible work ethic. Um, very, very scrappy and very, very tenacious entrepreneurs who aim to build companies that are uncopyable. So it's created by the environment of a lot of copycats. Imagine you were one of the companies that started eight years ago that saw an American company called Groupon. That looked pretty cool. You wanted to build a Groupon for China. Guess what? There are 5,000 of you. China had 5,000 Groupon copycats. And they um, each operated in their own ways. And today, there's one left, and 4,999 died. And think of it as a giant coliseum with 5,000 gladiators entering, basically knowing only one would win. And the only way you can be that winner is if you build something others can't copy. If you have a feature, others will copy it. If you have a you know, discount, others will copy it. If you, have, if you burn more money and give away more free food, others can copy it. So what can you do that's uncopyable? So in the particular case of Groupon, the Chinese entrepreneur named Wang Xing uh, in the company called Meituan uh, did the following. He changed the way Chinese people eat. So he dared to change the way Chinese people eat. Just like Steve Jobs changed the way people communicated with the iPhone, right? Of course, that's more you know, fancy technology, but changing the way people eat was not easy by any means. How do you change the way people eat? Well, how do you decide not to cook? Well, if takeout can be made available to you nearly instantaneously, nearly free delivery, most of you would not cook a good part of the time, right? Or not eat out. Well, that's what Wang Xing did. He mobilized a team of 600,000 uh, sub-minimum wage deliveries of people and motivated them with the Uber reverse surge pricing mechanism. And he found the cheapest delivery vehicle, a electrical moped whose battery runs out every two hours and needs to be changed. And he managed the operational excellence of this very hairy, ugly um, business that you're running with a giant turnover rate. 600,000 people, maybe a third would turn over every year due to the low wages, but he went after that and he perfected it. And he spent billions to figure out how to shave a few pennies every month until he got to 70 cents per delivery. And that, to most people, was close enough to free delivery. And what if he failed? Had he failed and and kept going and going, ended up with $1.70 per delivery, uh, he would then be losing $25 million a day because he's delivering 25 million orders to the Chinese people every day. So think about how he changed the way Chinese people eat. There is AI in all the routing, fancy stuff, reverse search pricing and all that stuff, but the bulk of the work is managing the 600,000 person minimum wage workforce with huge training requirements and large turnover. That's just not, that's, and once he built that, his competitor can't compete anymore. How would the competitor build, spend a few billion, how would you convince a VC to give you a few billion dollars to, to build you a, com, a competitive workforce? Even if you did, you, didn't, you don't have the data and the AI. He's got all the addresses and people and, and eating habits, and he knows how to entice you with what you want to eat tonight. I mean, May Tuan today knows what, you, what I want to eat more than I do myself. You know, the ads are better. So I think this is kind of the Chinese business model and spirit that I think Kellogg should be studying. And since you're not in the midst of Silicon Valley, I think Stanford would probably not want to study that because that's not fancy tech, but you know, I think Kellogg uh, should study. How does the Chinese internet companies build these impregnable business models? And that's really interesting. There are other examples I don't have time to go into. It's in my book, uh, talks about how DD does it versus Uber. 
how Taobao did it versus eBay. So in each of the cases, Chinese companies made itself an impregnable business model. So with that, the Chinese products got better and better. In the beginning, there were copycats on the blue side. Then in the green, they became inspired by US, not copycatted, inspired by US, but integrated features such that uh, they were built faster with iterations in a way better than the American product. There are many of you who probably use WhatsApp and WeChat simultaneously. Yes, and surely you would agree WeChat is a better product, right? And, and <laughs> WeChat is a better product than WhatsApp, and uh, Weibo is a better product than Twitter. May, maybe not in the diversity of content. Um, <laughs> but that's not the subject of this talk. But uh, Weibo is a better product in terms of usage, right? And so on and so forth. But then the most interesting are the third col orange column, which I won't go into because it takes five minutes to explain each company. These are brand new Chinese innovations that have emerged um, out of nothing. And these companies don't exist at all in the US. In fact, if people, sh if they're entrepreneurs in the room, copy to, from China might be very suitable now. So hopefully I've convinced you that Chinese companies started copying, but it's not true that once a cop copycat, always a copycat, you can become innovative through practice and then come up with the innovations that aren't the light bulb kind of Steve Jobs innovations. They're more like change the way people eat kind of innovations. And that has tremendous value. And that's what the Chinese companies did. And along with them, a lot of great entrepreneurs uh, who uh, work very hard. Uh, 996 is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. That's the minimum work hours <laughs> in startups in China. And also China now has more capital invested into AI, more money into China VC AI than US AI. Um, and just uh, for Sinovation Ventures, our, for us alone, we started four, four and a half years ago investing in AI, and we now have five unicorns or billion dollar companies with a total valuation of $21 billion uh, with phenomenal returns for our investors, but also shows you that AI is really taking off in China. This is not just, just words. Uh, this is all because it's no longer the era of research, of discovery. Uh, think of deep learning as inventing the electricity. That job was done. Now it's the age of monetizing and implementing and turning deep learning into applications. And that's what makes it an advantage for China, because I've illustrated how China is better at monetizing and building and speedily and tenaciously building companies. If, of course, what if someone came up with a brilliant new innovation that disrupts deep learning? Well, that's most likely, if I think that's a um, um, possible scenario, and if that happens, the advantage goes back to the US. But for now, I think clearly uh, we're on the right-hand side and uh, we're awaiting that innovation. I would love to see when that comes. But right now, I think implementation, deep learning has hardly been optimized for so many real-world applications. And deep learning needs is so hungry for more data. So more data gives you better results, as seen in this picture. More data gives you better results. So who has the most data? Well, in the era of AI, Data is the new oil, and China is the new Saudi Arabia. China has, <laughs> China has more users, three to four times more than the US in mobile, but 10 times more on delivery, food delivery, three, 300 times more on shared bicycles, and 50 times more in uh, mobile payment. And mobile payment is very important because that piece of data, more than anything else, is a definitive effort, definitive mark. Right? When you browse a page, it's not clear what you meant. But when you pay money, you're really serious about buying that. And all that data can be fed to make the AI work better. Uh, the Chinese mobile payment has exceeded Chinese GDP. Uh, if you go to China, for those of you who haven't been to China for a couple of years, be really careful because you better get your Alipay or WeChat Pay working. Otherwise, you can't buy things uh, in many places. They don't take cash. Like this farmer's market, there's no cash. Uh, if you go on the street and see a beggar, uh, they're probably, th they're not using, <laughs> they're not using pans anymore. The, pans, the days of pans and hats are gone. They're holding up a sign that says, 
I am hungry, scam me. The, uh, totally serious, I saw this just, just, just two, two weeks ago. So this is changing in China, and that means, imagine if you will, Facebook just got all the data from Visa and MasterCard and integrated the two databases together. Imagine how powerful that is. But also, it's not just giving Tencent that power, it's also individual merchants now can know which customer bought what, and that can be tremendously helpful. Uh, the last advantage from China is that the government does support AI tremendously. Uh, they came up with a plan last year, and once the plan came out in July 2017, as I mentioned, banks are buying AI software, uh, local governments are building uh, new roads for AI. Give you a few examples. Uh, there's a new city the size of Chicago that's being built in China from ground up, from nothing. It's empty, like, like the equivalent of desert land, uh, like Las Vegas. But the size of Chicago being built in China uh, called Xiong'an, it's next to Beijing. It's a brand new city, and it's going to have autonomous driving built in. And the way it will help autonomous driving is the downtown of that Xiong'an city will be laid, laid in two levels. The top level is all green, parks and everything with kids and pedestrians and bicycle and pets, but no cars allowed. Cars go to B1. And that means it's that immediately you don't have cars hitting pedestrians. And that makes it so much safer to test autonomous vehicles. We saw in Phoenix the worst kind of accident right? Autonomous driving. If autonomous car hits another car, at least they're both protected with metal. But if it hits a pedestrian, it's terrible. And downtowns are very hard. Also, Zhejiang province built a whole, a whole new highway to assist cars from uh, be, being uh, safe, safely driving uh, on the highway and not veering off the road. So those are the types of things that China has really helped tremendously to develop technology. Not quite what you read in the newspaper, giving lots of money to one company to target an American company. Um, I'm not saying that doesn't happen from time to time, but in the area of AI, all of these companies have been privately funded, and the government is stepping in now with public infrastructure that will help make these investments even better. So today, if we were to compare US and China, as in my book, <clears throat> I think U.S. is ahead. In five years, China will probably be slightly ahead. This is about implementation, monetization. Um, already today, China has the most valuable speech recognition, computer vision um, companies, um, as well as drone companies, machine translation companies in the world. U.S. still has the most valuable autonomous vehicle company, uh, but that's the kind of um, China is really moving very, very rapidly in building and implementation. So uh, business AI is the one area China is likely to stay behind, um, even five years from now, due to the lack of data warehousing. And then uh, autonomous AI, I am boldly projecting China to catch up, not because technology-wise China can catch up. U.S. is way ahead in technology, probably by about two and a half years, which in AI is a light year. You know. On the other hand, the Chinese policies are helping the autonomous vehicles from landing faster. Whereas uh, some of the American policies are facing um, hurdles and challenges, such as the truckers' union would like autonomous trucks not to be tested so soon. And that may or may not have an impact, but if it does, it will slow down the American development. Uh, but actually, I give, even though I draw this slide, I really don't think it's a zero-sum game. The Chinese VCs are funding Chinese companies, building Chinese AI for Chinese people, and the Americans likewise. So the gains from one Chinese AI company does not come at the expense of an American company. It, we're actually witnessing two parallel universes. So the purpose of writing the book is really twofold. One is to explain there are two parallel universes and they can learn from each other without getting into a zero-sum game. The second purpose is that there are a lot of challenges facing humanity with AI that are brought up that we should share experiences and work together as opposed to um, just getting into a, a big competition. So AI is moving forward very rapidly with all of these reasons. Two, two countries moving it forward as opposed to one country should be faster. Seven giants training a lot of people. 
um, a lot of venture capital. SoftBank has a billion, $100 billion investing in AI, and also platforms, AI platforms, making AI easier. So they will create about $16 trillion of value. This is $16 trillion of net increased global GDP by the year 2030. It will also bring a lot of challenges to, to the world. And we've heard about a lot about these privacy, security, bias issues. But to me, I think probably the bigger issue is wealth inequality. AI will create the ultra-rich, the people who found the AI companies, the traditional companies who adopt AI to create great efficiencies and who lay off large percentage of their workforce for great cost savings and net profitability. And then on the bottom are the people who are displaced. And that, I think, is a, is, a huge, is, a huge, is a huge challenge. So I think in the AI era, um, there are a lot of challenges that are facing, facing all of us. But I think it's really important to remember that um, AI is really more like the new electricity. It enables a lot of things. Certainly, it can enable weapons as well. But that really is a very small part. So hopefully, in this talk, you've gained the, um, uh, the, the um, awareness that AI has reached the level of electricity. Electricity was invented by Thomas Edison. AI deep learning was invented by Jeff Hinton. We're now in the process of applying AI to all kinds of applications. And China and US can and should work together um, to, to, move, to, uh, to move this forward. So um, really, the exciting thing is that AI has arrived. And it is driven by the two AI superpowers, the title of my book. So I hope um, uh, you will embrace this idea and find ways for the two countries to work together despite a lot of the challenges in our environment. Thank you.